another episode of Sustainability Uncovered. I'm your host, Neve, the part-time environmental sustainability officer at UPSU. I'm here again, as always, with my deputy, Kelsey. Say hello. Hi, everyone. Wonderful. So today, our topic is campaigning, and our guest, Jackie, is, no, is so familiar with this. She's the owner of the sustainability consultancy Urban Agenda Southwest. She's a prominent member within the Plymouth scene when it comes to sustainability. She coordinates the Environment Plymouth organisation and the leader of the award-winning Plastics Free Plymouth campaign. Please welcome Jackie Young. Hello, hi. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> no worries, it's wonderful to have you here today. So if you'd like to share a bit more what you yourself are currently working on, that'd be great. Well... My background has, has always been with environmental issues. Um, I studied environmental science at Plymouth, um, even before it was a university. So uh, I'll let you decide how old I am. But right the way back, I, I grew up on the South Downs in Sussex and I'm still in touch with my godmother who used to drag me up on the South Downs for long walks to tire me out before going to bed. And it never worked because I used to get home and, and talk about all the rabbits and the sheep and the harebells and the view so my poor grandmother gave up eventually but um, having studied environmental science I knew I wanted to work in environmental issues so I worked for about four and a half five years for groundwork here in Plymouth then I joined the local authority when sustainable development became an issue back in 1992 when agenda 21 was adopted a lot of local authorities in fact almost every local authority in the country took on a sustainability officer. So I did that for a while, spent 18 years with Plymouth City Council, looking at sustainability, climate change, carbon management, the council's own environmental policy and environmental management. But then they decided they didn't want me anymore in 2013. So gave myself a month off and used a, an, an old title that I, I had for a company, Urban Agenda Southwest, and that's now been running for just over eight years. So I do a lot of environmental management work, a lot of communication, a lot of writing and research. I manage Environment Plymouth, which is almost a full-time job. I lead on the Plastic Free Plymouth campaign, which is equally taxing. And a lot of my job is picking up on people's questions and either passing them on to the right person or finding out and researching the answers myself. So it, it just depends what the question is. Sometimes I can answer it. Sometimes I have to pass it on to one of, one of our network members. So what exactly does Environment Plymouth do other than take up most of your time and energy? <laughs> Environment Plymouth is, is the latest in um, a series of networks in the city. Uh, I think the first one was set up in 1993 as the Environment Forum in response to Agenda 21 and Local Agenda 21, which very much advocated the role of the community and neighbourhoods and residents in decision making on the environment, on sustainability, on social issues and on economic issues. It sort of it did, well, it didn't fizzle out. Sadly, the, the, the guy who took it on um, passed away. And then when he passed on, there wasn't really anybody to, to take it on. And it was in the early days of, of Zoom meetings. So there, was, there wasn't really much we could do with it. But back in 2016, the idea um, arose again. And Environment Plymouth is now the biggest green strategic network in the city. It's got probably upwards of 800 to 1,000 members, depending if you include the Plastic Free Community members into it as well. They inevitably are members of other networks. So if we put a newsletter out, for example, we know it gets cascaded down to you know residents and communities across the city. So quite, quite an interesting impact. But we basically work on issues that our members raise. Uh, current uh, favorites have been pesticide use saving the bees and the, the insects and be bee friendly corridors in the city where we work with closely with climate action plymouth and we're going to be doing some work on the community role in in, in climate action plans we lead on the plastic free campaign that was something we picked up in 2017 and we get involved in all sorts of um, other things. So as part of my role with Environment Plymouth, I work with the Chamber of Commerce as the 
lead on environment and climate change for businesses, very much what I used to do when I, I was at the, the council. And I work with Southwest Rotary, the, the sort of community element there, um, getting involved. And we just pick up on things that other people perhaps haven't picked up on. We're sort of an independent body, so we can ask the um, embarrassing and controversial questions that individuals perhaps don't want to do. And if there's something that obviously is worrying people about the environment, it doesn't have to be local, it could be international. We, you know, we try and respond to it. So I never quite know what I'm going to get when the phone rings or when I pick up an email. <laughs> And it could be anything from archaeology to zoology. It just depends what's bugging people at the time. It's definitely a great way to bring the community together to think on sustainable solutions and like put them forward to the right people. Mm. You're definitely no stranger to campaigning, as you said, with <laughs> the Passive Free Plymouth campaign. Why would you say it's so important for people to campaign when it comes to sustainable issues? I was, I was tasked a couple of years ago to put together a lecture on this, which I haven't done it this year for obvious reasons. But I mean, I've been campaigning since I was 12, I think, with the National Trust. So um, it's second nature to me. But it's a little bit like the proverbial sort of three or four year old and always asking why. And if you look back in history, many of the, the very well known campaigns as such have gone down in history as examples of when people have turned around and said, hang on, this isn't right. We, we want to change it. We want to do better. We want to improve. So it'd be interesting to know, for example, what would have happened to the Industrial Revolution if the Luddites who opposed mechanical uh, manufacturing had succeeded. They didn't. We have the Industrial Revolution. We've got climate change as a, as a result of, of man-made emissions. But... If you look at it, the French Revolution, you've got uprisings, even the, the British Civil War was about people saying, hang on, we, we need to do things differently. And campaigning has, has always really been that. Certainly in the, the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, it might have been the era of flower power and, and hippies. But a lot of their, what drove them was arguing for, for peace, anti-nuclear, um, the Greenham Common events. I'm, I'm sure a lot of, of, of your podcast watchers are, are, are probably too young to remember some of these things, but they very much dominated the arguments of what was good and what was right. Um, should we have American nuclear missiles on British soil? Um, and the answer was eventually no, and they, they eventually they went. But the only thing that I think with, with campaigning is a little odd, which we found with sustainability, is that Plymouth doesn't really have a lot of the campaign organisations you might expect. So Friends of the Earth have always found it difficult to keep a group going here. Greenpeace, CND. And we, I've, I've got a, a friend who's a journalist and we, and we have this constant um, almost bet to, to find out why that is. And the only thing we can think of is that it's probably a military thing. Um, we did do some research and we found that places that have got military bases tend not to have campaign organisations. Um, I don't know why. Um, perhaps the military doesn't welcome the questions quite so much. But campaigning is absolutely essential. It's about people saying, hang on, I don't like this. And it could be as simple as litter on the high street right the way through to international climate change it's recognized as something that someone wants to say something about and it can have all sorts of forms and all sorts of impacts some really odd and negative some incredibly positive there are a lot of people that say oh my gosh i have this issue about this and mm -hmm. they want to say no to all of these things but they don't necessarily follow through with it they just kind of keep it as a thought in their brain and don't actually act on it and I guess off of that would you say that there's enough campaigning going on for the environment do you think there should be more less <laughs> um, oh there's always got to be more for the environment it's such a massive subject and just when you think you've succeeded on one thing something else comes along the classic there was the Montreal Protocol and CFCs and the ozone layer 
one of the most successful ag international agreements. We've, we've closed the ozone hole and then climate change took off. So, you know, just when we thought we'd managed to do something with ozone, another gas came along and said, hello, there's always room for questioning. If, if we just allowed decision makers of any type, whether that's economic, political, social, whatever, to dictate or agree on our behalf, we wouldn't have half the diversity of views and approaches. So a lot of the issues that people campaign on, they, they might even agree with what's being done. It's just not the way it's being done or the speed at which it's being done or the actions that are being taken. So there's always room for far more campaigning. I think what people don't realize is those issues come up at, at really local and, and almost personal issues. And a lot of people don't feel confident enough to say something. So if they can find someone who will act on their behalf, um, you know, if we, if we need something doing on a legal basis, we go to a solicitor. If we want something doing on a campaign basis, we have to sort of sometimes find somebody who gives us that confidence to speak up and say, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't agree with this. And that's always been the case. Um, so I don't think enough campaigning is done. I seriously don't think that decision making bodies take it seriously enough from the community. One of the wonderful things about s sustainability in Agenda 21 was that um, the community had an equal right to decision makers of every type to, to put their, their ideas forward. It caused quite a lot of chaos. There were quite a lot of councils, um, parish, district, local authorities who just were not interested in, um, in being questioned. They were elected to make the decisions and they suddenly had this huge international body of people saying, hang on a minute, you know, you've got 200,000 people here. Have they agreed with it? Um, so I, I, I know it caused um, a lot of chaos, but at the same time, it gave the community a voice. And even since 1992, when that was introduced, we've seen some massive changes in the way that campaigns are run, what they've achieved, um, how people have been involved. And I think at the moment there is um, a great deal more opportunity for, for people to listen at every level. Um, campaigning is about listening as much as it is about waving placards and having a voice and making questions. So um, I think people at the moment need to learn to listen a little bit more to what is being said by the different campaigners and, and through the different questions that are being asked. So no, there's not enough campaigning, but equally there's not enough listening going on either. Yeah, most definitely. You have hinted at this ever so slightly, but would you like to elaborate on like what do you think makes is most important to making a successful campaign? That is a very interesting one because people campaign, um, they protest, if you like, in all sorts of different ways. At the moment, people are obviously very concerned about coronavirus. They, they don't want to go out. They don't want to put themselves or anybody else at risk. So we've been um, looking at different ways of people asking those questions to taking action. But we've also had the situation where sometimes um, actions are considered illegal. Um, a classic one is um, putting stickers or posters up or graffiti. Classic example we had in Plymouth when I was working with the council was um, a young lad um, he was, um, I think, from Albania or um, Bulgaria, somewhere like that. Um, a family of immigrants who'd come to Plymouth. He didn't like what was going on. So he went out and graffitied um, something about Serbia and Croatia during the Serb serbo croat war. When he was actually traced and found, he was gobsmacked because out there, Graffiti is considered a way of protesting. He didn't realize it was illegal in this country. And he was just gutted that he 
cause problems that he'd broken the law in, in the UK. So you, I think you have to be very careful with the way that you run your campaigns. You don't need to alienate people. Um, Environment Plymouth, a couple of years ago, or a year ago, took a decision to make it quite clear that, you know, we cannot endorse anything illegal. Um, and that could be anything. But there are some organisations who think that a shock and awe approach is important. It, it makes people stand up and think. And my old boss knew that if necessary, I would be there with a placard in front of a bulldozer. I never had to do it. But he knew that that intensity, that commitment was important. I think as a campaigner, you have to be you have to have a very strong sense of integrity. People need to be able to trust you. If you're going to do something, you don't do something that lands them in it as well. Because a lot of people want to have a say, but for whatever reason, whether it's their job or their family or their commitments, they find it difficult to have that say. So if you're going to speak on their behalf, you have to have a lot of integrity. You have to be accurate. You have to be putting the right information across. And I think there's also being persistent. You know, you you invariably end up as, as the sort of, um, it's the itch factor. Uh, if you know you've got a flea in a jumper somewhere, but you can't find the little bugger, it itches and itches and itches until you, you do something about it. That means you have to be quite, strong-willed you know you you know that if you're campaigning or something you're going to upset people but you've got to have that confidence to believe in what you're doing basically you, you've you've got to believe in what you're doing you've got to be honest you've got to be upfront transparent open you've got to be willing to change if somebody turns around and says oh hang on a minute that's not true you've got to be able to to, to be adaptable and flexible but I think the in you know over over 40 odd years of campaigning the the one thing that comes across is integrity yeah most definitely i c can relate to this to some extent with like being in my role and having to uphold views of the students when it comes to like union council or like other meetings so, so that they just get heard because that like, always they want to go forward themselves to get yeah. on their behalf but when it comes to campaigning do you think it actually causes change or does it sometimes just end up going into the void of like it depends with experience most environmental campaigns you can you can tell if they're going to be successful if they're still around five months after they were started there have been some things which have been very quick sharp reactive shocks to to issues but um in general, campaign interests last between five and six months. If they last any longer, then you, you've got a real issue on, on your, your lap. The Plastics campaign, Surfers Against Sewage, who run the Plastic Free Com Communities, bless them, they, they thought when they launched it in 2017, I think it was, that they were going to have 30 or 40 communities. If you look at their webpage now, they're currently on 718 and growing. And they've only got the same team. So you can imagine the pressure on them to, to work with goodness knows how many times the number that they were expecting. Um, but the plastics campaign, that could have fizzled out within five, six months. It didn't. And if you look at who's behind it, the, the David Attenborough Blue Planet programme um, that showed and, and, and aired the night before our meeting it had an impact, it, it tugged at heartstrings. So people took it seriously, they are still taking it seriously. And you know definitely that things are serious when businesses start asking questions. They're asking now about climate change and about carbon management. Okay, that might be something to do with um, the Chancellor threatening to introduce new carbon taxes, but you know, you can understand what's driving them. So, you know, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's care, sometimes it's love, sometimes it's peace. Sometimes it's religion. The other thing as well is that, as I said, a lot of the community involvement has come from sort of like the, the, the neighbourhoods, the residents upwards, and they can be communities of interest as much as communities of location. Now, you would not have seen so much action on equalities, on gay rights, um, transgender rights. OK, these things focus for a while. But every time they focus, they leave another notch 
in the twig or, or another step on the ladder going towards what you want to see. And in a lot of cases, people have raised issues that are, are things that are going wrong. People have done something, they've campaigned, they've raised money, whatever they've done for it. And it's made a difference. It's, even if it makes a difference to one person, it's made a difference to their lives. It's enriched their lives. So you have a lot of responsibility when you're campaigning. But depending on what it is, you know, sometimes you might have to just hold your hands up and say, look, it's passed, it's gone. We need to find something else or we need a different approach to it. But in other cases, it's seen massive differences and it's enriched so many lives because of it. So, yes, it is important and it does have an amazing impact on, on, on people and the environment for that matter too. I definitely agree that it does have such a big impact. And I think for students especially, we have the knowledge, we have the voice, but we just don't, I guess, know how to get there. How can students campaign? How do we push ourselves to that extent? Well, most of you, I'm, I'm sure, will have access to, to Google. We didn't. When I started, you know, laptops were, a, a, well, even computers. I, I don't think I had a computer till I was 25, 26. Um, but it really is a matter of if something is, is annoying you, do your homework. Find out who's dealing with it in the city or wherever it happens to be. Google the issue, see who, if there are any organisations dealing with it. Most of them will welcome new members. Most of them will have online websites, uh, Facebook pages that you can join in. But what I would say is give it a few weeks before you dive in, you know, holding your nose and with two feet at the deep end, because you may find that some of those groups are perhaps not doing things the way you want to. So you might have to say, OK, I, I want to do this, but not this way. The reason I say that is because what you don't want to do when you're just setting out in your career is put yourself at risk. This will probably make you very la laugh a lot, but and uh, I've never been arrested in my life. I don't think I'll even come close to it. But um, I was working down in Portsmouth and I got back to my job here in Plymouth to find out that special branch had been tailing me because we'd been working up on the, the hills above um, Portsmouth and there's a listening station there. Now, I have a friend who's actually in Special Branch, or he was in Special Branch, and I told him, and he fell about laughing. He went, you? So my boss and my, my friend tried to find out what it was, and it turned out that I was on Special Branch's blacklist because I'd been a Friends of the Earth press officer. So it, my name was on the bottom of press releases, and they put two and two together. Oh, she's a troublemaker. She is, you know, on the list. You know, don't let her in London or anything like that. Luckily, I was taken off. The, the, they, they managed to get me off the list just before I was going to go and do some work at HMS Drake, uh, which was an, an interesting concept. I'm pleased to say that, you know, I've, I've worked in Drake and at the, the nuclear sub base several times now without any problems. But it, it made the point that if you do something illegal if you get arrested if you put that risk into your campaigning at an early stage what you don't want is to go into that perfect interview for the perfect job 10 years later and find that you don't get it because you're on a list somewhere and it does happen people say oh no, that, that doesn't happen it does it happened to me and I was lucky that I managed to get off the list but you know, if you're older, wiser and more informed, then you can argue why you should or shouldn't be on that list. You're more confident. You might even be proud of being on the list. You know, some people might do that. But you do have to be very, very careful when you're starting out in, in your career. But otherwise, you know, the student body has got such a voice. We're working with a team at the moment at the university on food waste petitions and collections. We had Several people, um, I, I won't say who, at the council who turned around and said, oh, a food waste collection in Plymouth will never work because the, the students will never do it. They don't see it as important. And twice now we've proved that students, in fact, are interested and they do think it's serious. 
So working with Izzy and, and the team at the moment is very important because that's that's a I don't know how many students there are at the university at the moment. I, I know it got up to 33,000 at one point. I think it's about 19 at the moment. That's a big chunk of population to be annoying. So you, know, <laughs> you don't really want to sort of task every single student with the same brush and sort of say, oh, well, they'd never agree. Uh, how about asking them and seeing what they think and seeing what they do? And in most cases, students go, yeah, all right, we'll try it. But there are still people around who just won't do it. They won't ask. So student voices are incredibly important. They're incredibly important in terms of students' rights, their, the lifestyles they want to lead. Um, you know, they're, looking back, you know, the times when if you were gay, you definitely didn't say anything. You, you didn't want people to know just in case. Now, these days, you can be gay, loud and proud because the, the campaigns that have gone on have changed attitudes. And there are still people who need their minds changing on this. So there's still a need for that message to get out there. And student campaigning is absolutely amazing. The other thing that I do find is that students come up with things that us oldies would never even think about. And you sort of listen to, and you think, God almighty, I wish I'd thought of that. There's just so many um, inspirational and creative things that we can do with students. Images, I, I work with the um, Arts College uh, with a f photography team there. Um, some of the photographs they've come up with, I wouldn't have dared take a photo like that. But if that appeals to the under 25s or the 25 to 40s, then perhaps that's what we should be using. The student population has so much going for it. And I will always defend students in Plymouth because I was one once and I didn't get into trouble. Just. <laughs> so basically, Jackie is saying, don't mess with us. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But no, it definitely does emphasize, like, we, we, we essentially are like the future. And basically, we need to come up with more innovative ways of putting forward like sustainability as like the forefront of the future because it's going to affect us all it's going to affect our generation and the generation after us so it's mm. really yeah important. yeah I think that's absolutely right because students you know the millennials I'll, I'll call them the millennials bless them but um millennials have been brought up with a lot of this concern for the environment as second nature quite literally second nature they, they've never known a time when environmental issues climate change recycling hasn't been part of their everyday lives so you are a generation that actually knows what to do before being told what to do it if that makes sense which means that you can look at what perhaps goes on where you're from so say you're from Essex or London or Sussex and say well hang on a minute that happens there why doesn't it happen here and you go back to being the four-year-old going, why? Why? Uh, which is great. It's always good to ask. But um, equally, a lot of the campaigns we do, I mean, certainly with some, some sort of genders and, and, and some sort of um, generations, particularly, you have to sort of talk about grandchildren and great-grandchildren because that's what drives people. But with students, a lot of that's already in there. It's already inside. It's it's just there. I mean, how they deal with it, whether they take any notice of it is another matter. That's where the persuasion bit comes in. Um, but invariably, um, it's almost a shock horror if somebody threatens your comfortable day-to-day -day environmental beliefs. And that's what drives the campaigning. It's like, hang on a minute. We are not doing that. And then out you go and, and campaign. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think when students realise something or because we're so tuned to all these environmental issues, we're like, but wait, why didn't they do this? Why mm. did this not happen? Why did they not think of this? And I think the people that maybe don't ask those questions probably because they don't see it enough. Mm. And that's probably where social media comes in a little bit more. Yes, yeah. People need to physically see it on the everyday timelines and all their feeds just to realize oh this is an issue why is yeah. it 
happening. So what yeah. would you say is like the role of social media in campaigning, especially for students? Mm, it's, it's essential. I mean, in a lot of cases, I mean, having worked for the council, we, we've had excuses like well, we've always done it that way or we haven't got the time to research it. Doing, you know, just, just as much as campaign ca- campaigners need to do their homework, some of those services do as well. You know, if there is another way of doing things, they can't just sort of sit back at their desks and go, oh, I haven't got time for that because there may be other ways of doing it. Someone somewhere just asking, have you thought of this? So they've done a little bit of their campaign homework. They can quote who's doing it. So, well, Essex County Council's done this. That gives the incentive for people actually providing the services to, to go out and find out what everyone else is doing. The, I have to say that, you know, it's certainly not at the moment because of everything that's going on, but quite often people get into their jobs and they get very comfortable and they're very lazy in the nicest sense of the way. So someone comes along and asks why and they think, oh, bugger, I've got to do some work today. It happens. But the next step up from that is that if somebody doesn't go and do that work to find out and give a sensible answer back, it's the next step of the ladder to say, well, hang on a minute. Does the Herald know about this? Does Radio Devon know about this? Um, And you can use the press, you can use student voices in whatever way. And social media these days is a massive way of getting things across to benefit what you want to do. It is about cattle prods. It's about sort of gently prodding them. I'm I'm not suggesting tasers because that's a little bit extreme. But the, you know, the, the occasional cattle prod, you know, poke them up the bum and say, come on. What are you doing? You know, go and do it. Go and do your homework. Find out what's happening. Find out what makes us tick. Definitely. I definitely agree. I feel like sometimes we just need that little push just to mm. start. Just that little, you know, jump start. Mm. Get things going. Um, yeah. I think you know what my takeaway from everything that you've said is, and that will definitely be do your homework mm. and research what you need to know. But what would you say are the key points for people to remember from wealth of information you have shared (laughs) um basically do your homework um if you want to campaign if something seems to you that isn't right go online see if you can find a group if you're a one one man or one woman or a one person band do the homework if you're asking questions make sure your your information is is right that it's from a reputable source that you can quote it and, and, and sort of send people in the right direction so they can read it for themselves. Homework is absolutely essential because it it gives your campaign the depth that, you know, if people want to argue, they're going to have to go and do their own work themselves. And that's often quite difficult if you've got your information 100% correct. You've got to, you've got to be strong incredibly strong because a lot of people won't like what you're doing or they won't understand it's not so much they don't like it's that they probably don't understand and if that that misunderstanding scares them they'll come back at you because they're scared or that they don't have the same confidence they don't have the same drive as you do so you have to be very persuasive very strong very consistent very persuasive you do have to act within the law I know there are groups out there at the moment that are, take direct action as as blocking roads and sticking labels and, and tunnelling. It doesn't help. It doesn't help your own sta- status and situation, but it actually doesn't really help those organisations who are trying to do things properly either. We find that we spend a lot of time explaining why things haven't been done rather than why things have been done because of that. Okay, if nothing happens and you really feel that you have to take action um, to get into the papers to 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 make a difference, I'm not going to be the first one to turn around and say don't do it, but just you know eliminate all the other alternatives first. It makes so much more difference. So there's integrity, homework, and persistence, and believe in yourself. You know, if something is wrong. You might not feel confident enough to say something, but there will be somebody out there who is listening. And that, that's the same for everything, for mental health, for 
physical health if you you know if you're feeling something's wrong go and ask somebody who knows don't just leave it um you know if, if people hadn't asked questions about nuclear weapons if people hadn't asked questions about woodlands we wouldn't have some of the beautiful environments we've got people still need to ask those questions because there are still threats to them and there are still campaigns that people can get involved in um, and that campaign doesn't have to be here in Plymouth or locally to the UK it, it could be eradicating polio in South Africa it could be all sorts of things and you might think sit there and think you know I'm never going to get to Thailand to do this but you never know it could be an opening for gap years or something like that. You can put it on your CV if it's successful. It's a confidence thing. And future employers, as long as you've not done anything awkward or illegal, future employers will hang on. That's character building. I like that. And I know certainly that's, that's something that I've learned in the past is being able to um, put some examples into my CV of the really odd things that I've learned to do um, through campaigning. Um, I can do Watland Daub. You don't even know that that is, do you? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's a very, very old way of making walls. You, you mix clay and water with animal dung and you smear it on the walls. Um, so if you go to a heritage museum, you might see a, a 14th or 13th century cottage. You can guarantee that their, their walls will be Wattle and Daub. I can thatch. I can do um, hedge, hedge laying. And these were all sort of campaign skills that the National Trust taught me. So I can go out there and I can probably tell other people how to make hedgerows. Hedgerows make for good environments. They make for good wildlife habitats. So you can put things on your CV that you probably wouldn't even think of if you'd not campaigned. Yeah, most definitely. That, those are the best things to take away from this. We ask this question to everyone that comes on our podcast, and we were just wondering, how does campaigning fit in the wider UN sustainability goals? Two things. I, I, I was looking at the question, and um, the two things I, I think are most important. One is that none of those goals will be achieved if people don't campaign in one way or another. Someone's got to say something somewhere. The U, UN has stood up and said, you know, we want to act on this, this, this and this, water quality, food, poverty, women's rights, that sort of thing. If they'd not stood up and led the way, then other people coming behind them would not have had the confidence to go out and say, have you seen what's happening in wherever? We need to change this. We need to ask the questions. We need to say something. So that leadership that it provides is absolutely essential. The other thing that did strike me is that... Um, for about the last 10 years, sustainability has sort of been lost in the ether of, you know, people sort of got used to it. So it became not a secondary issue, but people don't think about it. They don't apply it as, as much as they used to in the, the, the 1990s and, and 2000s. They assume that someone else will do it. So I think, again, what it does is it provides that leadership. And by referring to the sustainability goals, you're actually perpetuating the community campaign right, the right to have a say that Agenda 21 brought in. So effectively, the campaign goals are the next tranche of Agenda 21. They, thinking about that, we're, you know, we're, we're in 2021. I don't know whether anyone's planning to do anything this year. But um, because, because they're there, it means people can't forget them. So again, although local authorities these days may not write the sustainability goals into their policies, their manifesto commitments, their election policies, that sort of thing, it, there's no reason why they can't be quoted when people are asking why. So you could start off your question with, in, a gen, you know, in, in the sustainability goal number, whatever, it says, whatever, and then ask why they're not considering it in their, their policies. It's a really good leadership thing. And I think if we didn't have it internationally, again, there would be so much going wrong in this world that at the moment is being held in abeyance. It's being improved. Can you just think what would happen if, if we had a, a global pandemic 
with some of the systems and services that we would not have had if the UN hadn't taken action. It, it would be horrendous. So um, they are incredibly important. They're probably just not promoted enough and not and they're, they're overlooked too much. Yeah, most definitely. It has like brought forward like a, cent- a centre ground for everyone to know about these issues, which wouldn't otherwise have like, been a bit overlooked. Thank you so much for talking to us today about campaign. That's okay. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed this as the podcast today. Thank you.